Sup, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, I know what you hair loss witchers are probably all thinking right now, but Kevin, what the hell is this crap? You said your next video was going to be a response video to Andrew Huberman. You be a liar, bro. Okay, rest assured, I am working on a response video to Andrew Huberman's video about hair loss. Today, however, I'd like to take a small detour to revisit a subject that comes up often in the hair loss forums, and that subject is microneedling, and that is because this subject actually ties into what Dr. Huberman brings up regarding microneedling in his video. In his argument, he actually references a Dr. Robert England, who has his PhD in being a medical editor who specializes in the blood flu theory. Rob England wrote a review article on microneedling that was published in 2022. Andrew Huberman calls the article an excellent review of microneedling, and frankly, I had to double-check Andrew Huberman's delivery to see if I could find any signs of sarcasm, but sadly, it looks like he was actually being serious. So, I'm not making this video to cover Mr. England's lackluster review article, because I already went over that article just a couple months ago in my video on the dark side of microneedling, and I'll link that video below in case you haven't seen it yet. As it turns out, though, there is a new study on microneedling that came out just this year, which Dr. Huberman and Rob England haven't mentioned at all yet. So, I thought it might be best to go over this data before launching into my full response video to Dr. Huberman's video, which again, don't worry, will be coming soon, Shooms. So, before we delve into this, let's summarize where microneedling might actually have some utility for a hair loss sufferer. Microneedling has been shown to improve the effectiveness of topical minoxidil, and that's probably by just breaking down the skin barrier in order to improve the absorption of minoxidil into the scalp. That's it. That is literally the only thing it is useful for in regards to hair loss, and it isn't even necessary to do this as there are better alternatives. Case in point. Adding the compound known as tretinoin to minoxidil is a better alternative because it actually improves the conversion of minoxidil into the active metabolite minoxidil sulfate by upregulating the enzyme sulfotransferase, which is the enzyme that converts minoxidil into its active form minoxidil sulfate. Nevertheless, studies do show that microneedling can be used to improve the absorption of minoxidil, which may be good for poor responders to minoxidil, so that is one valid reason to use it, even though, like I said, there are better alternatives for minoxidil non responders like tretinoin. However, the proponents of microneedling don't stop there. They claim that microneedling, even when used as a standalone treatment, stimulates hair growth, and they speculate that it works by causing inflammation or by stimulating hair growth signaling pathways, and they'll even claim that it somehow works by breaking up fibrosis in the scalp, and of course, there is no evidence for any of this whatsofucking ever, but to all the people who want to speculate about how microneedling works to stop hair loss, you're forgetting something very important and that is proving that microneedling works as a standalone treatment to begin with. What's the point of trying to figure out how something works when it's never been proven to work? There are a lot of medications in the market that work without us fully understanding the mechanism behind it. Even minoxidil, which is an FDA-approved treatment for hair loss, has a mechanism that isn't fully understood, despite what Dr. Huberman claims, and we'll get to that in the next video. So... All these theories about why microneedling works are as useless as dead tits on a zombie until someone actually proves it works to begin with. When microneedling fanatics insist that it works as anything more than just a weak adjunctive therapy to minoxidil, they are on very shaky grounds because there are very few studies on using microneedling alone to treat hair loss and the studies are very poorly designed. Also, for every study showing a positive effect of microneedling on hair growth, there is another matching study showing no effect at all. Even Rob England in his review article states that out of the six studies done on standalone microneedling therapy, three of them showed some effect and three showed no effect at all. Rob concludes in his article that clinical studies showed microneedling demonstrated generally favorable results when used as an adjunctive therapy in androgenic alopecia, but even when used as a combination therapy with minoxidil, the data is of relatively low quality. Beyond this, there is so little data on microneedling as a standalone treatment that any new article on this subject at all is probably newsworthy. Worthy. That's why I thought it would be worthwhile to present this article from Brazil. This article is titled, quote, Efficacy and Safety of Scalp Microneedling and Male Pattern Hair Loss, unquote. Now, this article is behind a paywall and it isn't on Sci-Hub yet, but I don't mind shelling out some money to trigger a bunch of microneedling fanboys who are too afraid to use finasteride, yet they think constantly stabbing their scalp is going to save their hair. So... 
This article mentions right away that most of the studies on microneedling use microneedling in conjunction with some other agent like topical minoxidil. Thus, like I said, there are very few studies on using microneedling as a standalone treatment. There is some human data on using microneedling to treat acne scars, but usually microneedling is used in a limited fashion for treating those scars, while in people with hair loss, we are talking about long-term treatment since, after all, hair loss is linked to our genes and therefore any treatment has to be used indefinitely, and that is a at least until we have CRISPR gene editing technology, which I talked about in a video, which I'll link below. When it comes to using microneedling specifically as a standalone treatment, there isn't a whole lot of human data on using microneedling long-term or even short-term for the treatment of androgenic alopecia. So, in this new study, the investigators enrolled men 18 years and older with at least Norwood 3 androgenic alopecia, so not necessarily severe hair loss, but definitely severe enough hair loss to be noticeable. So, to conduct the study, the subjects dropped all their previous hair loss treatments for at least six months. So that means none of them were on finasteride, minoxidil, or anything else that could be confounding factors that would influence the outcome of this study. So these subjects were off treatment for a very long time before they enrolled in this study, so the methods here were very good. 30 men were enrolled in the study. These men were randomly assigned to use two different microneedling devices. One device was a doctor roller device with 192 needles, and the other was a tattooing device with 17 needles. The men got microneedling every four weeks for a total of four times, so basically we're talking about monthly microneedling done over four months. The study lasted a total of 32 weeks. So for the microneedling, an anesthetic cream was applied to the scalp, and then the devices were applied over the scalp until pinpoint bleeding occurred. This figure here shows how the study proceeded. As you can see, there was a fair amount of dropouts during the study, with only 8 men in the roller limb and 11 men in the tattoo cartridge limb finishing the study. The investigators assessed scalp coverage using before and after pictures, and they measured scalp density using phototrichograms over a 0.79 square inch area. So, what were the results? Well, like I said, a fair number of subjects dropped out of the study, though the investigators claimed this dropout was not due to the painful procedure itself, although I'm a little skeptical about that since these subjects did draw blood after all. Anyways, looking at the scalp coverage at the first follow-up visit, which was four weeks after the last microneedling session, four out of 12 men in the roller group and two out of 14 in the tattoo cartridge group showed improvement in their scalp coverage as judged by the photos. Of those six responders, only two in the roller group and one in the cartridge group still showed a response 16 weeks after after the last microneedling session. So looking at hair density by phototrichogram, which is a much more objective measurement than just looking at photos of the scalp, which can be influenced by factors like lighting and hairstyling, there was no improvement in total hair count during follow-ups. And actually, as it turns out, there was a decrease in hair counts when all the subjects were pulled together, though it didn't reach statistical significance. There was more of a decrease in hair counts in the roller group than the tattoo cartridge group, where there was a slight increase in hair counts, but overall, there was a decrease in hair counts with microneedling compared with baseline regardless of the instrument that was used. So regarding safety, there were no major side effects like infection, though the average pain score was 6.75 out of 10. That isn't a trivial number we're talking about here, Chooms. Just to put that into perspective, that's somewhere between dreadful and horrible on the pain scale. So this is not the most pleasant procedure we're talking about here. And keep in mind, this is pain they felt despite using local anesthetics, hence why I'm skeptical of the claim from the researchers that the dropouts had nothing to do with the pain of microneedling. In addition, biopsies were performed in the study subjects, and 10 subjects actually showed evidence of new collagen formation and breakdown of elastic tissue on biopsy. This is not a good thing at all here, Chooms, because these findings are considered hallmarks of scarring, which is the end stage of androgenic alopecia, and definitely not something we want to see in our scalps if we're fighting hair loss. So, the investigators concluded that these two commercially available devices showed no benefit for hair growth whatsoever. The researchers then compared their results to previous studies on microneedling, and they note that most of the studies that showed improvement with microneedling combined it with something else, like minoxidil or platelet-rich plasma therapy. They also note that different protocols using different devices or more microneedling sessions might show different results. Also, they note that in most of the previous studies, the subjects were younger and had less severe androgenic alopecia. The average age of the subjects in the current study was 46 years old. Anyways, 
They note that the results of the few studies done on microneedling alone show inconsistent results, and that may be because there is no standard protocol for microneedling. I also have to mention that I have noticed that whenever someone says microneedling didn't work for them, people will always try to counter this with the no true Scotsman fallacy, and then insist they weren't doing microneedling the right way, which doesn't really mean anything, since everybody seems to have a different interpretation of what the right way really is. I imagine those very same people would try to use this no true Scotsman fallacy against this study, as well as any other study on microneedling that doesn't confirm their biases, and then they claim that if the only they used the right device or the right frequency of application, the results would have somehow been different. However, adding this study to the three negative microneedling studies mentioned in Rob England's review article, we now have four negative studies of standalone microneedling, all of which use different microneedling protocols. So the evidence that standalone microneedling works is becoming weaker and weaker as time goes by, and the burden of proof is on microneedling supporters to prove that microneedling works as a standalone treatment. So far, it hasn't proven to work. But of course, these negative studies are a convenient marketing tactic, so hairline fraud cells can claim that if only they had used their microneedling device or their microneedling protocols, the results would have somehow been positive. So this isn't a definitive study on microneedling as a monotherapy, but it does add to the previously published research and increases my skepticism that microneedling alone does anything. I would also be very worried about the fact that some signs of scarring were found in the biopsies in this study, especially after just four microneedling sessions, because remember, scarring is what DHT eventually does to your hair follicles after it destroys them. So if we can literally see scarring happen in as little as just four sessions, who knows what doing this for years would result in? Nobody knows, though, because nobody has studied the effects of long-term microneedling. Also, Lastly, I have to point out that a common counterpoint I've seen people make who have watched my videos on microneedling or on other points is that they'll often bring up how doctors disagree with me. They'll be all like, oh yeah, Kevin, well, I heard the hair loss show and Dr. Gary Linkov recommend microneedling and they are far more qualified than you, so haha. -ha. Look. There is a good reason why expert opinions are ranked amongst the lowest in the hierarchy of scientific evidence, and that is because just being a doctor or a scientist doesn't make you automatically right, and that is something to also keep in mind when I upload my response video to Andrew Huberman later. So I am sure the hair loss show and Dr. Gary Linkov are all sincere in their convictions about microneedling, but if you want to seriously claim that microneedling is useful as anything more than just a weak adjunctive therapy for minoxidil, then the burden of proof is on them. Being doctors does not relieve them of that burden. If there are no strong randomized trials proving microneedling works as a model therapy, it doesn't matter how many experts claim that it works. We need research data, not just opinions to prove scientific claims. I, of course, welcome disagreements, but saying I'm wrong because other people say so is not a real argument. So at this point, I think I'm going to go back to working on my response to Dr. Huberman's video, but I hope you all enjoyed this little detour about microneedling. Next video, though, will definitely be my response to Huberman, so don't worry, that is still coming, and I'll see you when it is uploaded. God bless.